All right, let's uh, go ahead and get started. I'll, I'll pray for us. Father, thank you uh, so much for giving us the privilege of uh, being here today and looking at your word and wrestling with uh, different ideas. Um, we never want to be over your word. We want to be under your word and we want to think your thoughts after you. Your word says that um, the Bible makes wise the simple, and we desire to be wise. You say, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. And so we are asking today uh, that you help us. I pray as we interact with your word that you help us uh, put the pieces of your puzzle together in a way that will bring you great honor. And I pray that in result we'll, be, uh, we'll love you more and love other people more. Uh, we make this prayer not claiming any kind of inherent superiority or uh, not claiming to be inherently better uh, than anyone else. But we make this prayer because our Lord Jesus has lived the perfect life in our behalf, has died for our sins, and is guaranteed that one day we'll be completely transformed. Uh, and uh, Thank you uh, for introducing uh, yourself, Mason. Thank you. All right. So uh, today we're going to look at Isaiah 6. Uh, for the next uh, few times together, we're going to look at 6 through 12. 7 is that incredibly interesting passage about the virgin will uh, conceive and bear a son. But in building up to that and uh, the material in 8 and 9, 11 and 12, before we do all of that, we're going to look at 6, which kind of starts things off. And this is a very unusual uh, chapter in the Bible, and it's full of mystery. Uh, I don't know anyone who would come to this chapter and say, oh, I, I know fully uh, what uh, this chapter is about. I certainly would not uh, say that. But what we're going to do is look at Isaiah 6, and in particular, um, we're stepping back and kind of examining the question, what would it be like to be in the presence of God? Um, if God granted you entrance into his heavenly court and you saw what that heavenly court was like, um, what would you feel like? What would you experience? Uh, would it be um, a, a happy time? Would it be a scary time? Uh, would it be fearful? Uh, what would it like to be like to go into uh, the heavenly throne room of God? Because that's what happens to Isaiah in Isaiah 6. And what we're going to see is that we're going to get to feel Isaiah's experience, and then um, we're going to hear a pretty strange commission from God to Isaiah. Uh, in fact, it's so strange that it's hardly ever uh, preached about, but oddly enough, it is quoted in the New Testament. Um, and so... Um, Today will be more about experiencing something. Um, maybe that's part of our learning something next time, but um, we're just going to look at some things uh, together in Isaiah 6. And if uh, you ask me, well, how would you fit this together with kind of uh, the introductory material in this class? And, well, one is it 
it's going to help us. How do you read a book? Like, how do you read big sections of scripture? Um, we're going to take a deep dive into uh, this passage as the preface for uh, 7 through 12. Um, next time, we're going to dive into this whole question, who is this virgin in Isaiah 7? Um, and the particular questions for today, what do you think of the power, majesty, and holiness of God? And how do you think of your own wisdom and your own power and your own inherent ability in light of who and what God is? When we look at Isaiah as a whole, it's interesting that Isaiah uh, records these words of God. But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. If you want to know the kind of people that God likes uh, to empower to do things, it's not pushy people. It's not people when they look, uh, when they walk into a room, uh, people who say, look at me, look at me, look at me. It's not people who just think they're God's gift uh, to humanity. God says that he looks on the humble and the contrite of spirit and someone who trembles at my word. There are a lot of people today who will make fun of God's word and who dismiss God's word. People who say, I know the Bible says this, but I... When somebody says that, you can take it to the bank. That's not someone God thinks a lot of. That's not someone who speaks for God. The people who speak for God have an attitude toward God's word of fear and majesty and holiness of God. And at the very end, that's uh, as Isaiah is closing out the book, if you want to know what people who really have been around God are like, they're humble, they're contrite in terms of uh, they recognize their own sin and they're sorry for it and they want to live differently and they tremble at God's word. Maybe that's a way for us to put this entire uh, message uh, uh, together as we look at this in chapter 6. Because... What we do as a people, and I, I think Calvin may have said this, that our hearts are little idol factories. Our hearts are little idol factories in that instead of having a picture of God as he presents himself, we want God to kind of be like us. And so when we conceive of what God is like, we kind of, bring an image of ourselves and think, well, God's like me, but maybe a little better. God doesn't like idols. God wants to present his own picture, and we see uh, his own picture in the um, pages of his word, and we see a glimpse in, of incredible vision in Isaiah 6. It's interesting that when you look at the history of interpretation, um, what people do is they draw pictures of God. And it's interesting, if you go to Italy and you look at pictures of God, God looks like an Italian. And if you go to Egypt and to the Coptic people, God looks like a Coptic. And if you go to anywhere and you see, uh, you know, you go, go to a European uh, 
church uh, uh, that has images, God will look an awful lot like the people who live in that place because we like to make God look like us. And the Bible is saying, don't do that. God wants to draw his own picture of himself. We come, well, um, I have a slide a little out of order here, but I'll read this one. When Isaiah saw God, this was his response. Woe is me, for I'm ruined. When, if you want to know what it would be like to walk into heaven, um, into God's throne room, Isaiah had been being a faithful prophet for five whole chapters. He had proclaimed God's message. He had been inspired. But God granted him a vision and he saw God and his immediate thought was, I'm going to die. I'm ruined. And the reason, so even though I'm a prophet and even though I proclaim God's message, the truth is I'm a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the king, the king, the Lord of armies. When Isaiah says, what is God like? He says, God is like this overwhelming thing. I, God let me uh, get a vision, a little vision of who he was and the immediate um, uh, experience, the immediate sensation was, I am utterly ruined. Seeing God as he is, is seeing the Lord God as he describes himself. I've never seen a statue in any church that made me fear God. I've seen lots of idols that want to say God is just like me. And the truth is God is nothing like me. Seeing God as he is, is seeing the Lord God as he describes himself. When we look at the book of Isaiah, uh, Isaiah has 66 chapters and oddly enough, uh, 39 of those chapters are oddly related to the Old Testament uh, description of God. And 27 of those chapters are oddly related to the New Testament description of God. And you wonder if God in his like artistic glory um, made Isaiah kind of a mini Bible if you will. There are major sections. The one that we're going to take a deep dive into is a description of the child king. And this is going to be really odd because you, you read it and you wonder, well, who is this talking about? Is it talking about Hezekiah? Is it talking about uh, Isaiah's own kids? Is it uh, talking about some unnamed person? Because right in the middle of this section, it starts describing this child king as God and even calling him by the names of God. And uh, by the end, in chapters 11 and 12, it's describing this restored Garden of Eden where animals don't kill each other anymore and where uh, God's glory is on the earth. Uh, 26 through 29 is sometimes called the little apocalypse. And in the middle of that section, um, it talks about this temple being built on a cornerstone. And like, who is the cornerstone? Is, is the cornerstone God or is the cornerstone uh, someone else? And in the middle of that little apocalypse, uh, it has this strange passage quoted 
in John 3 where it says, you have done all our works for us? 36 through 39 is all about Hezekiah. And um, uh, Hezekiah has a preeminent, uh, uh, wonderful, godly thing that he does in defending Jerusalem when uh, Jerusalem is about to be destroyed. Uh, and God um, responds to Hezekiah's prayer and sends one angel who kills 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. The text uh, uh, says, and they woke up dead. And it's like, man, that's going to be a pretty bad day. You know, the alarm clock goes off and you wake up and you're dead. Like 185,000, like one soldier and like the entire Assyrian army had been wiped out. Hezekiah was great, uh, great thing that he did in praying and putting his own life on the line, going into uh, the Lord's temple and uh, spreading out the letter that blasphemed the God of Israel, and God responded to his prayer. And then when all those dead people were there, they went out and looted the uh, um camp and Hezekiah uh, became incredibly rich and God told Hezekiah that he was going to die and oh Hezekiah just begged God not to do that and God says okay I'll give you 15 extra years and in those 15 years Hezekiah had a wicked son named Manasseh the most wicked king uh, of any of uh, the kings of Judah, Manasseh, a man who killed his own father-in-law, who actually was Isaiah, uh, sawed him in two, the text uh, says in Hebrews. And when he recovers and with this all plundered wealth, he has to boast of it. And he shows the wealth to Babylonian envoys And Isaiah sends him a message and says, the Babylonians are going to take all this wealth away. And so you wonder, well, is Hezekiah the child king who's going to bring, of the increase of his kingdom, there will be no end? Or is it another child king? And then we have 40 through 53, which is the suffering servant, who's a king-like figure that oddly seems like he's also God. And God, in the midst of that section, says, I don't share my glory with anyone else. And right in the middle of that section, I am God, there is no other. To me, every knee will uh, swear allegiance And every tongue will confess. And and that's the Lord speaking, Y-H-W-H. And Paul quotes that of Jesus and says, To Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue swear allegiance. And then in the final chapters, we have the eschatological consummation where this heavenly Jerusalem is pictured Uh, God's work is coming to conclusion. And then it says at the very end in 66, the redeemed people, very last verse, it says from time to time they'll go outside of the city and look on those who have rebelled against God. And the uh, book ends and their worm doesn't die and the fire isn't quenched and of course Jesus quotes that of hell and it's like what in the world is going on we're going to look at some of those things as we look at this book of Isaiah in our closing um, sessions uh, together but this is where it starts in terms of our deep dive It says, in the year that King Uzziah 
died. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, and notice this isn't all caps, so in Hebrew it's telling us it's the uh, word Adonai. I saw Adonai sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Now this is really interesting because you may or may not know that Uzziah was a really good king. He reigned for a really long time. He did lots of good things. Um, his name means the strength of God. But as often happens when prosperity comes, with it comes pride. And Isaiah decided that it wasn't enough for him to be a king, that he needed to be a priest too. And so he made priestly robes for himself. Uh, he dressed up like a priest and he marched into the temple of God. And the appointed priests were begging him not to do it. And he was saying, get out of my way. Uh, he's uh, felt like he was king. He should be priest too. And so he went in. And when he entered the temple, the Lord struck him with leprosy. Struck him with a living death. And he didn't realize that he had leprosy. And they were trying to get him out of the temple. And finally one of the priests said, look, you... You've been struck with leprosy. And he was more than willing to get out then. And he got out, but then he was leprous the rest of his life. And he died alone, uh, exiled from being king and from being priest. And his son Jotham uh, reigned in his uh, stead. Jewish interpreters don't know what to make of this in the year that King Uzziah died, some take that of his literal death. Uh, some take that of his uh, sentence of death of living leprosy. Um, I don't know. I probably favor the literal side, but it's interesting that Jews take uh, a possibility that it was his what some call a civil death, being exiled. This is a really weird sentence because if you remember his grandson, Hezekiah, you remember what he did with the letter? He went in the temple. He was putting his own life on the line. He was saying, look, this ruler is blaspheming. So his grandfather walked in kind of proud and Hezekiah walks in humble and says, I know I'm not really supposed to be here, but look at what this man is saying about you and uh, your people. However we're to understand that, Isaiah is saying, this crucial thing that happened in my life, it happened in that same year. That same year that King Uzziah died. And he says, I saw Adonai, and his robe filled the temple. Uh, in Hebrew, it literally says the train of his robe filled the temple. And uh, this morning, I just wanted to read through that again um, as I prepared for this lecture. And I was struck by the fact that that phrase, the train of his temple, is used uh, every time before this, it's used a priest in the temple. And it's almost like God is a priest. And the train of his robe, the little priestly blue tassels that have pomegranates and bells, we're told, uh, that just that little bit of uh, the Lord as priest filled um, the temple. And then we have a picture that uh, for my money, is maybe one of the strangest in the entire Bible. It says, above him stood the seraphim. 
This is the only place in the entire Bible where angels are called seraphim. Nowhere else are they called seraphim. Only in this passage. And it would be enough, and many scholars will say, we have no idea who these angels are. They have six wings, and the living creatures in Revelation uh, 4 or 5, I think, have six wings. So some wonder if these are the living creatures in uh, Revelation 5. Uh, those creatures in Revelation 5 elsewhere are the exact description of the cherubs in Ezekiel 1 and 10. And so a lot of people say the seraphim are just the cherubs, but uh, why, why do they have a different name? And then it describes these seraphs in a really weird way. It says, with two of his wings, he covered his face. That's very odd because to cover your face in the Hebrew Bible is usually a bad thing. Um, in uh, Genesis 38, I think, when uh, Tamar dresses up like a prostitute, um, she covers her face. Um, perhaps out of the shame of the profession, um, perhaps something else, but she covers her face. It's a different word used in, uh, in, in Hebrew than used here, but Haman, in the book of Esther, when Haman has plotted to kill all the Jews, and he doesn't realize Esther is a Jew. And Esther, of course, knows she's a Jew and knows that her people have been uh, put uh, under an order of utter extermination, um, and she's wanting to save her people. And so she throws a, a party for her husband, uh, King Ahasuerus, and she does everything uh, she can to make him happy. And... She doesn't ask him on that day. She does it again on the second day. And then uh, she, uh, he says, well, what do you want? And she says, I, I want to live uh, because uh, someone's put me under the sentence of death. And Ahasuerus says, who is it? And she says, it's this wicked Haman who was there celebrating. And the king is so infuriated that he leaves. And Haman realizes that if Esther doesn't change her request, that he's going to be killed. And so he tries to plead with her. And in the process, he accidentally stumbles. And as he stumbles, he falls on Esther right as King Ahasuerus comes back in so it looks like Haman is assaulting Esther and the king says do away with Haman and the first part of that is they cover Haman's face so it's really odd that these um seraphs are covering their face because usually that's a bad thing in the Bible. And then it says, with two of the wings, he covered his feet, which is really odd in the Bible too because usually, like that technical phrase is usually like covering your nakedness. And if these creatures are, if covering their feet is used like elsewhere, then these creatures are described as naked in heaven. And they would be the only naked creatures in heaven. And maybe we're reading that right or maybe reading wrongly 
but they're calling out to one another and they're saying, holy, holy, holy. What in the world is going on? Two verses and like, oh my goodness, we are in over our head. What in the world is going on? And who is this one being described as the Lord? Well, we're not left in the dark because the text actually tells us that what Isaiah was seeing was Jesus. John 12 says, He has blinded their eyes, he has hardened their hearts, so that they would not see their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted and I heal them. That's a quotation of the end of Isaiah 6. And then John 12 says, These things Isaiah said because he, that is Isaiah, saw his glory and spoke of him. And the hymn there is Jesus. So we don't have to guess what Isaiah was seeing because John tells us he was seeing Jesus. He was seeing the glorified uh, Jesus in the heavenly uh, throne room sitting on God's throne. But who are these seraphs? And this is where it gets really, really, really weird in this story. And if we were Jews, we would pick up on the weirdness of this right away. What in the world are the seraphs? This word... Uh, this is our word, seraphim, in Isaiah 6, 2. Uh, and if we wanted to know, like, who these seraphs are, what could we do to find out? Like, what should we do if we want to say, I want to know, I want to know who these are. What, would, what should we do? Would it be interesting if we looked up where that word appeared elsewhere in the Bible? Would that be... Um... <laughs> Chase, you've been in too many of my classes. I've ruined you. Uh... Like, let's just do a search. Where else they appear? We're told that the seraphs fly around... Where else does that appear in the Bible? Well, the exact word, can you see that like this word and that word, can you see that they're exactly the same? This little guy is how you say the word the. So can you see that these two words are exactly the same? Okay, how, how are they translated in Numbers 21.6? The word seraphim appears in that uh, verse. How is it translated there? Help me. How is it translated there? Serpents. In fact, the word saraf uh, means to be on fire. The singular form of the word is make a fiery serpent and put it on a pole and everyone who's bitten by the fiery serpent 
when he sees the image of the fiery serpent on a pole, that person will live. Okay, just to show hands. How many of you would say this is a little weird? Like, okay, I'm not really sure. I mean, is it an accident that the word seraphim and the word fiery serpent are exactly the same word? Or are they completely different things? Um, Deuteronomy 8.5 uses the word, uh, describes God who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its seraph and scorpion and thirsty ground where there was no water. He brought you out of the flinty, uh, brought you water out of the flinty rock. And Isaiah himself in 1429 says, Rejoice not, O Philistia, all of you, that the rod that struck you is broken, for from the serpent's root uh, will come forth an adder, and its fruit will be the flying, fiery serpent. So it's like, Judgments of God, snake, serpent, adder, seraph. So, like, think of, like, the most snakiest snake terrifying that you can think of. And that's what a seraph normally would be. Well, in Isaiah 36, he uses... That, that same image again an oracle on the beast of the Negev oh and did you recognize that the word flying is joined with it uh, and in in Hebrew there are like these things called binions uh, kind of specialty things you put verbs into. And this is a really weird one. And it happens to be that exact one that's in um, Isaiah 6. Flying around. Maybe the picture is like this, you know, or something. So you're thinking of this like, snake that's on fire that's like doing this in the presence of God how many of you are terrified if you're seeing that like what what in the world can you see that's the exact same word this one's a participle that's why it has this little guy on it and this one's not a participle but otherwise it's the same uh, Binion, um, I should know the name of it, but I can't recall it right now, but it's the same one. So, maybe snakes, maybe on fire, maybe winged like the cherubs, in the presence of God, burning. Okay, that burning thing is weird too because burning usually is not a good thing, you know? Correct me if I'm wrong, but seraph is not the Hebrew word that's used for serpent. It's not. That's the word nahash. But do you have a question? Why, why did he say to the snake, 
out of those. Actually, uh, I have some interesting thing. They have uh, recently discovered the best preserved fossils of snake they've ever found and discovered that uh, there actually are plenty of ancient snake species that they cannot explain how this happened, but had back legs that were crawling around with enlarged skulls, enlarged mouths, all of this stuff, and that somehow these, across all the snake species, there are, have been adaptations to where they crawl on their bellies, and now that's the norm. Again, from the evolutionary perspective, they've tried to explain it, but they cannot figure out why that happened. So. Uh, I, I wonder if the point is, like, I so don't know what's going on now. Like, okay, flying snakes haven't been something that I've ever experienced. I went and tried to um, research this a little bit and um, read some things about uh, cobras in Africa. And I did not know that cobras will climb trees uh, and attack their prey from the trees. And so some people conjectured, uh, you know, the idea of a flying serpent. I don't know, this seems to be describing creatures that have actual wings, um, but I have no idea. But it really is weird that this exact same word is the exact word that's being used of these super snakes in um, Isaiah. So it isn't just numbers, it's actually Isaiah that's using. And Caleb, you were making the great connection. What does the tabernacle look like in terms of gold, bdellium, onyx, the immediate presence of God? Nehushtan, yeah, I mean, all of these things are connected. Like, I know that I'm feeling exactly like Isaiah did. I don't belong here. This is like, if these creatures are burning because they're so in love with God, that hasn't been a part of my experience. Like God is a consuming fire and like, like Eden and snakes and like I'm ruined, right? That's exactly, so we're feeling, whoever these are, if, if, if they're positive like, like they're super cherubs and if they're negative like, God is punishing them in his presence. And both of those ideas are terrifying. But yet there's uh, one of them manages, despite being a snake, to pick up tongs from the altar and go and purify Isaiah's lips by touching them, which suggests that it is a positive thing. It, which could, that's exactly right, except that he himself isn't allowed to touch he has to touch it with tongs. I mean, could could this be in the uh, picture of Oriental rulers who make their conquered kings grovel at their feet and serve and praise and like, I don't know. I just know that this is a weird word and uh, the seraph is a weird word, and they're doing things that look negative, but then they're praising God and working in God's service, and I really don't know. Like, I'm baffled. Except that, I know that, like, 
this is weird and I, I'm not half as smart. I'm not a third, I'm not a hundredth as smart as I thought I was. Um, and there's more going on here and I'm ruined unless God does something for me. Whatever Isaiah is experiencing, it's some kind of heavenly version of this. And it's completely different from what I imagined. And God is somehow the priest. And somehow this is related to the heavenly vision of these living creatures. These creatures aren't pictured as on fire, but they do have six wings. Four wings. They're, at least I think it's four wings in so, like, I don't know. They're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord who was and is and is to come. It's some kind of heavenly, holy of holy vision Maybe snake-like? I know it's supposed to be terrifying. Uh, it does say in Ezekiel, as for the uh, likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire. And the torches, the appearance of torches moving to and fro among the living creatures. Oh, wow, I, I didn't pick that up. So I'd say that they So, that's where we're going to end and we're going to pick up on Wednesday. <laughs>